Let's stand. Let's look at God's word. So let me do what he just did, but you're going to respond, all right? God is good. And all the time. Okay, now, now say it with a little bit more pep. God is good. And all the time. Amen. So we're going to look at Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 to 3. And Psalm 133, verses 1 through 2. So Philippians 4, 2 to 3, and then Psalm 133, and we'll look at verses 1 and 2. All right, so follow as I read. If you don't happen to have your Bible, the text will be on the screen behind me. I won't need the projection on the back screen. Thank you. I plead with Euodia, and I plead with Sinchi to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. And then if you will look at Psalm 133, verses 1 and 2, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It is like the precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down the collar of his robes. The Lord will bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Plays well with others. You know, when I was in elementary school, oh, I need to digress. I need to welcome a new couple here, and that's uh, Chris and Julie Lawrence. Hey. <laughs> I should say a new married couple, a new married couple, because they've been here. But hey, congratulations. We're excited that you're here this morning. Plays well with others. When I was in elementary school, students received, at least four times a year, report cards. They were literally report cards, you know, made out of paper with handwritten notes from the teachers. And each quarter, I was to bring the report card home, have my mom take a look at it. She'd read it. She'd sign it as an acknowledgement, and then I would return it back to school the next day. And although my mother was concerned about my sisters and my grades, she was far more eager to find and then read the handwritten notes from our teachers. She was especially attentive to what was said about our behavior. She loved reading statements like, plays well with others. I wonder if I'm being too simplistic when I say that lessons like playing well with others established in a person's life from a young age could help avert actions like the ones we witnessed this past week. And perhaps I'm not being simplistic at all, since that short statement contains several implications, cooperation, understanding, respect of others, to name a few. You know, dear ones, if anyone should know how to play well with others, and beyond that, how to live well with others. If anyone should know how to do that, it should be the people of God. It should be disciples of Jesus Christ. And in fact, we, God's people, are to model strong, healthy, life-producing relationships. Does anybody agree with that? Now, there's a passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians that, that I love. Listen to this. Listen to what Paul says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on God's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's an amazing, that's an amazing passage of Scripture. The Father, God, has reconciled himself to us 
through his son, Jesus. He reconciled himself to us. Where there was conflict, now there is union. God has reconciled himself with sinful humanity through his son, Jesus Christ. Paul goes on to say that because of what God has done, then we who have repented and received Christ as our Savior, we have been given the message of reconciliation. And we're to tell others what God has done for us and what he wants to do for them. Paul says that we are ministers of reconciliation. In other words, we've got the answer. We've got the key that will set people free, that will cause people to come into this living, vibrant relationship with God, their creator. We are now ministers of reconciliation. So we've got to share it. We've got the message. We've got the key. We've got the answer. So we're expected to share it. Listen, friends. The devil knows that his days are numbered. Jesus is coming back soon. Do we understand that? Jesus is coming soon. So the devil is ratcheting up his activity. Consider, just consider what has happened this past week. And you put with that what happened in Orlando a couple of weeks ago. And you keep going back a few weeks and keep adding to the things that are occurring across our land. There is no doubt that the enemy is ratcheting up his activity. So what are we to do? Are we to run and hide and hold our breath until Jesus calls us home? Absolutely not. Because we, we are ministers of reconciliation. Because we have been given the message of reconciliation. Because we have been given the key that will unlock the cells that God has, that the enemy has built around people to keep them from a loving Savior. It's on us. So we cannot run and hide and hope everything goes away. No, no, we've got to behave. We've got to behave like the police officers did in Dallas. And when we hear the enemy's gunfire, we don't run away. We run toward the gunfire in the name of Jesus Christ, empowered by the Spirit, and we deliver the ministry, the message of reconciliation. Somebody say something. Either agree with me or don't, but please say something. The only hope, friends, the only hope this world has is Jesus. You know what we need? You know what we need? We need to see more people get saved. We want to see changes. We want to see changes in our system. We want to see changes in Minneapolis. We want to see changes in Baton Rouge. We want to see changes in Dallas. More people need to get saved. We want to see, we want to see the restoration of Detroit. People need to come to Jesus. And it's on us. It's on us. Because we have been given the message of reconciliation. So as ministers of reconciliation, we're commissioned to declare the good news. Holy God has provided the means for sinful humanity to be reconciled to him. That's an amazing message. But let me tell you. If we, God's people, don't live in peace with one another, then why should the world believe us? Did you hear me? If we are not living at peace with one another, then why should the world believe us? Their rationale will be, listen, if two humans who declare this message can't be reconciled to each other, then what possibility do I have to be reconciled with those I hate, let alone be reconciled to a holy God? I think you have to admit that that's pretty good logic. That's pretty good reasoning. So I'll say it again. We... God's people, followers of Jesus, are to model strong, healthy, life-producing relationships. 
You know, Philippians is an amazing little book in the Bible. We studied it together as a church not too long ago. And in those four chapters, we're taught the power of prayer, how to increase our joy, how to live with, how to live with peace, how to live and be like Jesus. And in the middle of all of that powerful biblical principles and doctrinal teaching, Paul makes an impassioned appeal to two Christian women. His exact words are, I plead with you, Euodia, and I plead with you, Sinchi, to agree with each other in the Lord. Paul tells them to iron things out. Whatever it is that happened, he's telling them, get it right. Iron it out. Get restored. Come into correct relationship with each other. Can you imagine this? Please, can you imagine this? The letter to the Philippians. So when those letters were received, these epistles that are now part of the scriptures that now we draw God's word from, when they, you, know, you understand, right, that these were not just delivered, you know, confidential to the pastor. He read them and he filed them. These were read. These were read to the people. So here, here, here you've got the Philippians and, and, and Paul's letter is being read to them and they're listening and they're learning and, and they're receiving it. Boy, he's got everything in there. And I'm sure when he got to the passage about Jesus' humility and how he, how he was humble and obedient all the way to the cross, and I'm sure that they were moved. I mean, they were hearing that I'm moved and I've read that I don't know how many times and I've preached and I've heard sermons, but they're hearing this for the first time, these inspired Holy Spirit words. And you can only imagine what's happening there. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of this letter, and I plead with you, you Odia, and I plead with you, Sinchi, get your act together, knock it off. How do you think that went? I don't know if it went that well for you, Odia and Sinchi. I guess a lot of eyes are like, oh boy, I'm glad he didn't put my name in there. Was Paul overreacting? <clears throat> Is he overreacting? Well, let's see. Paul pleads with them. He could have commanded them. He was the apostle. But he pleads with them. He's being very intentional with his words. We need more of that today. We need less political rhetoric. We need less politically correct verbiage. What we need is deliberate, intentional, well-thought, Spirit-saturated communication. That's what we need. I plead with you is what he said. That Greek word behind the word plead is paraclete. And that's the Greek word that we use to describe. It's used to describe the Holy Spirit. So there's the key to all this relationship business, the activity of the Holy Spirit. More on him in a moment. Paul pleads with them and then reminds them of how they contended. He said, you contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. You see what he's doing here? He's putting the situation in perspective. He, he's, he's saying to these women, come on, ladies. You've been involved in something much bigger, much bigger than yourselves. You stood by my side as we contended for the gospel, as we delivered the message of reconciliation. Please, compared to that, this is really pretty small. Let's take care of it. Let's be done with it. Don't allow the enemy to sideline you with this business. Come to a place of agreement in the Lord. And then when you refer back to chapter 2, and he speaks about having the mind of Christ. See, Paul's not insisting that they think the same about everything? Do you understand that we do not have to think the same about everything? Now, certain things we better think the same about. Everything that's in here. But do you understand that our opinions can be different? Do you understand that if I'm in a room with four people and we're all thinking the same thing, then four people are not necessary. I could be in there by myself. 
So he's not insisting that they think the same about everything, but he is telling them that even if they have different viewpoints to maintain the selfless attitude of Christ toward each other. In other words, in your disagreement, don't be contentious. Paul is saying, ladies, there's so much at stake. Don't remain trapped in this behavior. Get it resolved. Be reconciled to each other now in Jesus Christ and get along and get about the work of the kingdom. And then he says, I'll even raise up one of the brothers to come alongside you and help you bring this resolution. I can only imagine what that guy was feeling in that moment. But he goes on to say, but he's a strong man. He's a partner in ministry. He'll help you. Let's get this matter resolved. No, Paul was not overreacting. Again, we have the message that's needed. We have the key that will bring freedom and deliverance. But friends, we've got to make sure that our behavior gives credence to our message. Are you with me so far? We read it earlier from Psalm 133. And in there, Paul, I'm sorry, David gives us some beautiful words, and Psalm 133 is far more than a beautifully written song. Let me read it to you. I'll read all three verses this time. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It's like the precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even his forevermore. That's far more, friends, than just a beautiful psalm, a beautiful song. It holds the key to what will make our relationships a powerful witness to the world. In verse 2, David tells us that unity or healthy relationships among believers is like the anointing oil that was poured out on Aaron when he was singled out by God to be the first priest of Israel. And I submit to you this morning that the components of that anointing oil provide a picture of the Holy Spirit's desired activity within our relationships. In Exodus 30, you can look it up when you go home, we're told the components of this oil. It was made up of myrrh, sweet cinnamon, sweet calamus, and cassia. And as I said, those ingredients tell us something about our relationships and the Holy Spirit's desire to work in our relationships. First of all, myrrh. Myrrh has a bitter quality. Would you agree with me that at times relationships are not pretty? Sometimes they're not pretty. When we purpose to work and serve in unity, we will be tested. There are those times that we will experience cuts and bruises. But if we can just keep in mind that we can do things together that we just can't do alone, those bruises will be worth it. We need to understand that when believers come together to serve God and his purposes, that that goes beyond just being each other's buddy. But that indeed, the Lord is establishing divine partnerships. He wants to work through us together. And together with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can shake. We can shake the enemy's operation while advancing God's kingdom. When we keep things in proper perspective, as Paul attempted to do with these two women in Philippi, we will work we will work through our discomfort because we know what the result will be. God is using us. At the same time, he's changing us. He's making us more like his son. Another thing about myrrh, although it's bitter, myrrh has an element that promotes calmness and balance. The Holy Spirit calms us in our relationships. If we let him, he brings peace into our relationships. Two, sweet cinnamon. This ingredient reduces heart disease. The Holy Spirit can use relationships to promote and provide healing. 
Now, this component of the anointing oil re- reminds us, reminds us of the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit, which strengthens us to pursue and maintain unity in our relationships with each other. Sweet calamus. This component has an antispasmodic property. So it relieves all kinds of spasms, especially those in the nervous system. Friends, when we allow him to, the Holy Spirit brings stability. Friends, if we let him, he'll correct the crazies that sometimes have a way of coming through. I'm not talking crazies like people, but those, those, those things that happen sometimes in a relationship. He'll calm that down. Cassia stimulates circulation. Blood flow increases even to the joints that have become stiff. The Spirit of God uses relationships to keep us flexible, to keep us pliable in his service. Friends, things are revealed in us when we're in relationship. Things that the Holy Spirit will bring to our attention that could actually hinder us. But when we address that, we remain flexible. We remain pliable. Friends, our anointing oil, the Spirit of God, will help us grow and thrive in our relationships with one another. You know, Pastor, I don't know if that's been my experience. Well, I got to ask you, how often are you inviting the Spirit of God into your relationships? How often are you submitting to him? in those divine partnerships. And as we grow and thrive, friends, with each other, then that provides a powerful witness to those outside of God's grace, a witness to a society which is desperately looking for answers when it comes to relationship. So it's critical that we remain submitted to the Holy Spirit. So I'm getting ready to wrap this up so we can come to the table of the Lord. But you know, as pastors, Sandy and I have been in the people business for now 40 years. So when it comes to relationships, there's a lot that we've seen, and there's also a lot that we've learned. So, so here's, here's just a few. Here, here's just a few that I'll give to you as counsel, takeaways when it comes to our relationships with one another. Real practical. Number one, talk less, pray more. It's pretty simple, right? Talk less, pray more. When you're offended <laughs> with somebody, oh, I should say you're uptight with somebody, offended that's by, that by somebody. Friends, there's a breakdown in that relationship. Please don't be so quick. Don't be so quick to pull others in. Go to Jesus first. Go to Jesus first. I, I, I got to ask, why is, it, why is it that we're so prone to want to get others involved? Now, I know when I've asked that question over the years, here's what I get. Well, because, Pastor, I needed to, I ne- I needed to get a company of people around me praying. And so you had to deliver every nitty-gritty detail about the breakdown in your relationship so that they could pray with greater discernment. Come on, we're supposed to be spirit-filled people around here. I think that the Holy Spirit can reveal some things to us. You don't have to tell us every nitty-gritty detail. Now, here's my, here, it's, it's a theory, but I think, I think I, I've gone through this enough that I could probably prove it. I think the reason we're prone to go talk to people is because, first of all, we want to justify ourselves. And secondly, we hope that we can change that person's estimation of the other person so that we can get them to agree with our estimation of that, come on, of that person. So it works something like this. Pastor Shannon, come over here. I'm just hurting. I'm just hurting. Come over here. I know you. Come over here. I I just need you to pray. I just need you to pray. But Kevin... There's been a breakdown in our relationship. And let me tell you what he did. You know, 
I asked him to do this, but he refused. He just ignored me, and he did this. I've been patient with him. But then he does this. I just feel like he's taking advantage of me. And what's more, he doesn't need all that. He doesn't need all that. What am I trying to do? Justify my behavior and make Kevin look a little bit different in his sight. And depending on Shannon, I might be effective. Talk less, pray more. Come on now. Hey, I'm not even doing the Paul thing. I'm not calling names out. (laughs) Talk less, pray more. We always go to God first. Pray. Call out to him. Open out your heart. But, Pastor, I need counsel. We'll start with the Holy Spirit, the one that Jesus called the counselor. We should ask the Holy Spirit to mentor, to mentor our mind. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to show us how to think about this situation, how to think about this matter. Listen, when Jesus said, follow me, he meant that we follow him with our feet and with our minds. We need to be thinking correctly. So go to him first. And by the way, if we're going to counsel individuals through a conflict, then like, like the man that Paul selected for Euodia and Sinchi, that means we're leading individuals to resolution. We're leading re- individuals to reconciliation. We're not just hanging around to hear the stories. All right? Number two, sit down, get clarity, and strive for resolution. When there's a breakdown in a relationship, please address it. Just address it. Don't let it go on. Don't let the gap get wider and wider and wider. Don't let the wounds get deeper and deeper. Just sit down and talk. Sit down. Now, that's who you talk to. You start by talking with Jesus. Then you talk with the individual with whom you have a relationship, and you know that there's been a breakdown. Sit down and talk. Now, I know those conversations are not easy. I don't like having them. I will do my best to avoid them. This is how I avoid them. I try to, God, please take care of this. Please change them. And the Lord says, nope, you're responsible for this. I'll give you what you need. You sit down and talk with them. Sit down and talk with the person. Look, I spoke about the oil before. In the story of the Good Samaritan, the Samaritan helped the wounded man by pouring both oil and wine into the wound. The oil soothed, but the wine must have felt like a thousand bee stings, that alcohol hitting that wound. But the wine was necessary to kill the bacteria. We need to bring both love and truth into these matters so we can experience healing. Number three, instruct through the conflict and avoid complete breakdown. If a situation is brought to you as a parent or as a friend, please don't just do the mercy thing. You know what I mean. Oh, poor baby. Poor baby. Where does it hurt? Let me kiss that boo-boo. And don't you worry about it. Don't you worry about it. I'm going to be mad right with you at that bad, horrible person. Knock it off. Just knock it off. We need oil and we need wine. So when a situation comes to us, we take that. We take that as as, as a point of teaching and we sit down with the person and say, listen, my heart hurts for you that there's been this breakdown, but here's what you should do. And we outline what the scriptures indicate when it comes to coming to a person where there's been an offense so they could be healing and restoration. I know you're hurting, but here's what you need to do so you can grow. So you can grow and Jesus will be glorified. Number four, stay sweet. That's the order of the day. Always stay sweet. I spoke with a young pastor not too long ago that was going through a horrific time at his church. And and, and he was telling me some things that were occurring and how some members were behaving. And I kept thinking, my goodness, these, these people, these, they're acting like the devil. And these same people would say to him, you know, that they were spirit-filled. And I was thinking, well, they're filled with some spirit. But, but it's not the Holy Spirit. So we talked, and I, I told him some things to do and how to navigate that. 
And then I said to him, but you know, in everything that's occurring, in every confrontation you have to have, in every discussion, you want to make sure to stay sweet. Don't let this stuff, don't let this stuff get into your spirit. Don't you let this stuff, don't you let this direct and dictate how you minister in the future. You got to deal with it. You got to make the corrections. You've got to, you've got to confront this, but you want to stay sweet. Friends, we got to stay sweet. Because that's why we had that sweet cinnamon, huh? The Holy Spirit is there. To keep us sweet, we confront, we deal, we correct, but then we move forward. And Pastor Shannon, you can come back as I make my fifth point. Always remember, always remember what Jesus promotes and what the devil hates. In Jesus' prayer on the night before his crucifixion, he brought several things before the Father. And in that prayer, he included the church. And what did he pray for the church? Oh, make them one. Make them one as we are one. Jesus promotes unity among his children. Divine partnerships, healthy, life-producing relationships, a powerful witness to the world. That's what Jesus promotes. And what the Satan hates? He hates that God's people would come together. What he wants to do is bring division and disruption. So friends, let's stay on the alert. Let's not give him a foothold. Let's shut it down. Just shut him down. Quickly. Quickly. And allow the Lord to do what he desires, which is unity. Strong healthy relationship.